Right, we can now begin. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good evening, councillors, officers, and members of the, of the public that may be watching our full council for tonight. I'll go straight into the agenda. Item one, apologies for absence. Do I have any? N no. Okay. Apologies from Councillor Mark Wilkinson. Okay. Nick Churchill was supposed to give apologies for uh, Carter. Yes. I was just about to. Right, okay. So that's for Simon, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. Any more apologies? No. Item two, declarations of interest. Do we have any? None. Okay, item three, minutes of the uh, meeting of 10th of December 2020, pages 5 to 21. Do we agree those minutes? Agreed. Excellent, we're doing well. Okay, communications from the chair. Now, I don't know if anyone else was watching the virtual Holocaust mm. memorial service last night, but that is the only thing that I've done as, as chair since I did the, um, well, I suppose it must have been the remembrance service virtual. So there's not a lot going on at the moment, but things will pick up um, as we go through the year. Okay, so um, I was very moved by what the um, people was, were um, bringing through last night and um, raised roof and they were fabulous as they always are. So it was a very worthwhile thing to watch on YouTube and the Facebook. And I think you can still watch it if you missed it. Okay, item five, petitions from the public. There are none. Item six, questions from the public. Now we've got nine questions. So Jake, are you here? Jake Shepherd? Oh, I am. Okay, hi Jake. Um, your question is to Councillor Chris Finch. So would you like to read out your question? Yes, of course. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hoku. A current Economic and Social Research Council project led by Dr Holly Ryan of Queen Mary University of London seeks to reinvigorate poly policy makers' interest in town twinning and assist policy officials by building an evidence base on value that goes beyond the economic offer of town twinning. The last publicly recorded institutional link between Harlow District Council and our, our twin towns was the appointment of a Harlow councillor uh, in 2013-14 to the Harlow Town Twinning Association. I further note the absence of council representation for the current municipal year. How resolved is Harlow Council in sustaining its links with Haradov, uh, Czechia and Valise uh, Villacouble, France, when research suggests a pattern of munis municipalities forgetting their twin towns? Uh, Councillor Chris Vince, would you like to reply? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jake. Um, as you'll be aware, town twinning emerged after World War II to help and try to build relations uh, between uh, countries involved in the conflict. Within Harlow, the Harlow Town Twinning Association helped maintain the town's relationship with, with Haverhoff and Valise Villa Kublai. I should have checked out how to pronounce that. Apologies, Jake. Uh, until it was disbanded in 2014. The council does recognise that twinning, twin towns do offer benefits beyond just economic uh, and can provide an opportunity for cultural enrichment. However, at this time, the council does not have the resources to actively maintain its link to both twins town, twin towns or to assume the role of the Twinning Association. Today, we are setting out a budget for the next financial year. This is something we can look at into over that year. And, to, and for following years if possible. Sadly, as you'll probably understand, um, with recent events that have happened uh, in this country and obviously across, across the world, um, it has not become, it's not been a council priority. Thank you, councillor. Um, Jake, would you like a supplementary on this one? Uh, no, that's, that's fine. Thank you for the uh, reply. And you've got a second question for councillor Vince, I believe. Would you like um, to read that one? I'm, I'm satisfied it was answered in the previous answer. And again, thank you to Councillor Vince for that response. So that's fine as read. Chair, can I just, can I just add then, um, just, just to say to, to obviously Jake that, that, that 
despite obviously the, the, the previous answer and obviously the limitations that we have got as a council, I've been more than happy to sort of work with him and talk to him about, you know, what we, what we possibly can do to obviously build that, that relationship in the future. I look forward to discussing that with him in the future as well. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Um, item uh, question three on this is from Mr. Roy Court. Um, I believe, Lisa, you're going to read this one out. It's to Councillor Mark Ingle. Thank you, Chair. On May 1st, 2019, you invited residents to suggest areas which could be used to provide additional parking spaces within housing estates. Can you provide me with a list of one, areas where residents suggested lands could be used for this purpose? Two, what has been done by the council to assess these areas? And three, a list of areas which have been completed and the number of new spaces created. Councillor Mark Ingle, can you reply to that question? Thank you. Councillor Ingle? There you go. First one to be caught out by the mute button. Thank you, Chair. Ah. And thank you, Mr Court, for your question. Following my invitation for residents to suggest potential areas for parking schemes, a press statement was released in September 2019, setting out schemes which would be progressed to provide 73 additional spaces. These included a scheme in Hookfield, which was completed later that year, provided nine, providing nine spaces, a scheme in Longfield, providing eight spaces. Several sites suggested by councillors and or residents for the first phase which were as follows, providing 56 spaces. Shawbridge, 12 spaces. Warley Hook, 15 spaces. Pear Tree Mead, six spaces. Spinning Wheel <coughs> Mead, 15 spaces. Barn Mead, five acres, eight spaces. Although planning is currently refused, uh, is, planning has been refused and is currently on hold. And Bishopsfield, the number of spaces are yet to be confirmed. Therefore, minus the scheme at Barn Mead, five acres, there are 65 deliverable spaces. A number of other sites have been considered for later phases. The council carried out a robust assessment of all sites that will be progressed to development and looked at the practicalities and costs associated with creating spaces on these sites. Where sites have not yet been assessed, this will be done prior to the sites progressing. Unfortunately, due to the need to obtain planning permission and then the challenges presented by COVID, no further schemes apart from that at Hookfield have been delivered. However, I can assure you that providing additional parking is still a priority for this council and there is a pipeline of schemes to deliver much needed parking spaces in the town. We're looking to complete these as soon as we can. Subject to COVID restrictions, it is hoped these can be delivered in 2021-2022. Thank you, Councillor Engel. Um, question four is from Mick Patrick to Councillor Danny Purton. Uh, can you read your question out, Mick? Thank you. Certainly. In documents related to future developments in Harlow and Gilston, and the Gilston State, that affordable rented accommodation will form part of these developments. Furthermore, given Council's homes rent formula and the local housing allowance figures, the Council must have data on low band wage earners. Therefore, please could you state what consultation that the Council has had with social housing providers and number two, whether the council has any authority or social housing rent. Thank you, Mick. Councillor Purton, can you reply to this question? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the majority of development within the Harlow and Gilston Garden Town will actually take place within East Hertfordshire and Epping Forest districts. As such, Harlow Council does not have any responsibility for liaising with social housing providers or for setting rent levels in these areas. Of the forecast 16,100 new homes within the Garden Town area, only 2,700 are actually located within the Harlow boundary. That is the strategic site at the east of Harlow. This site is in private ownership and it will be for the developer of that site to come forward to the council in due course with their proposals for the delivery of affordable housing in line with the council's planning policy on affordable housing. 
The regulator of social housing directs the setting of social rents as part of the rent standard. The regulator of social housing regulates rents charged by social housing stock owning authorities. And that governs and restricts rent increases on social rents. The latest rent standard runs for a period of at least five years from 2020. Registered providers need to comply in full with both its own provisions and the rent standards policy statement to ensure compliance. Thank you, Councillor Purton. Uh, Mick, do you want a supplementary on this question? Um, no, just to say that um, I'll be in contact and find out well, I'd like to find out later what, what rents these um, levels will be set at and what percentage of um, um, hundred of, of um, market rents they will be. Okay, Nick, yeah. thanks very much. Okay, we go on to question five from Robert Bruce to Councillor Mark Ingle. Uh, Lisa, you're going to read this one out, I understand. Chair, I note that at full council meeting on the 29th of October 2020, you were asked a suppl supplementary question by Councillor Hardware concerning the amount of new homes bonus Harlow Council had received in respect of two former office buildings that have been converted to flats. You said that you would provide him with a written response. This response is not recorded anywhere. My question is twofold. Firstly, can you provide me with details for each of the last seven financial years the sum of money Harlow Council has received from the government in respect of all the new homes created from the conversion of offices into flats? And secondly, what if any of this money has been spent directly or indeed exclusively to help the flight of those residents who occupy these homes, often having to live many miles away from family and friends and support networks? Thank you, Lisa. Councillor Engel, can you re reply to this question? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Bruce, for your question. Um, the Council does not receive new homes bonus in respect of each specific new home that is created. The payments have been based on the overall increase in house numbers year on year across the town. This makes it very difficult to assess exactly how much has been received for specific pro properties. Due to be pressures being experienced within the Revenues and Benefits Service at the current time, it's not been possible to fully answer your question, but I can provide a partial response in respect of one of the properties referenced in Councillor Hardware's supplementary question as follows. The property in question, Terminus House, was entered on the rating list from April 2018. The building created 222 additional housing units. However, taking uh, into account the impacts of council tax discounts and the local council tax support scheme, which in itself is a discount on council tax, the net taxable units for the purposes of the new homes bonus calculations is just under 40 homes. Further adjustment reflecting the actual banding of the new units and the tier split between Essex County Council and Harlow results in a calculated new homes bonus payment of £34,800 for the entire property. This payment will be received for four years, giving a total accumulated new homes bonus payment of £139,200 from 2018 to 2022. As set out in reports being presented to Council this evening, the Council allocates all of its new homes bonus payment to its discretionary services fund, which helps to support the provision of a number of services available to all residents of the town. These services include the advice contract with Citizens Advice Bureau, to which any of the residents of the permitted de developments have access. This will include benefit support, financial advice and many other support networks. I would add that the conversion of the property to residential removed over £200,000 of business rates income from Harlow, or £800,000 over the four-year period of the uh, new homes bonus. And that loss is ongoing well after the new homes bonus ends. Thank you, Councillor Engel. Question six, Alan Leverett to Councillor Tony Durkin. Would you like to read your question out, Alan? 
Yes, thank you. Good evening, councillors and uh, officers. Um, this is to Councillor Tony Durkin. In, in response to my question to uh, you at the full council on the 10th of December, you informed me that the cost of the renovation of the 15 flats at Prentice Place was 2.845 million. This equates to 190,000 per flat. Does the council consider this good value for money for the residents? Uh, Thank yes. you. Uh, the answer, uh, Chair, is yes. Okay. Uh, can I ask a supplementary? Right. Uh, okay. Bearing yep. in mind uh, you've recently uh, uh, let out a contract for 16 houses and external works for Bushy Croft at a cost of uh, 2.6 million. This equates to 162,000 for uh, new houses and the associated works. Do you, do you still think this is good value for money at Prentice Place? Absolutely. Okay, Councillor Durkin. Um, Alan, you've got another question, item, uh, question seven to Councillor Durkin. At the meeting, you informed me that um, the procedures used leading up to the occupation of flats would be in place in December. Can you please provide me with an update on the progress you've made towards uh, residents uh, taking occupation of the council, uh, the council register, from the council register taking occupation of these homes. Yeah, um, I can. Uh, but Prentice Place Scheme provides badly needed new council homes that will be allocated to applicants on the council housing needs register. I can confirm that the four that were handed over have now been allocated uh, to local people, but because of COVID, they can't move in just at the present time. Further additional work was required in the main building for uh, fire stoppaging and building control priorities electrics aligned to the latest government guidelines for a new build property. As I said, four properties were advertised prior to Christmas and offers made and accompanied viewings have been booked with successful applicants. However, all services associated with the letting process, adverts offers, uh, accompanying viewing, etc., has had to be suspended uh, due to the lockdown. Alan, do you have a supplementary on this question? Right, so, yeah. Thank you very much for that answer. I appreciate that. Um, the answer you gave was the question and uh, there's some building control works in relation to fire stopping being done and electrical works. Now, this will be very, very much a, a thing which is done in the beginning of a contract. As you probably know, I was in building control previous to this, so I know that would be the fact. Now, I was just wondering, whether, did the contract uh, for the renovation include any, an expected delivery date for completion of the works of the flats? And was there a financial penalty written into the contract for de not delivering on time? OK, well, you've asked a number of questions in that one question uh, reply, but I, so I'll take the top one. And I do refer you back to the answer that I gave, that absolutely everything about the doors, the fire, uh, the fuse boxes, everything was done in accordance with what was required at that particular time. It is unfortunate, regrettable, but actually for safety reasons, that the government has changed the guidance through Grenfell and other issues. And it's right, appropriate and proper that the council takes due diligence, brings our services bang up to date to absolutely ensure that our residents are provided with safe and secure buildings. Thank you, Chair. You're Thank you, Councillor Dirk. Well, okay, in all fairness, you did ask four questions in a one question answer. So I'm only answering okay. the first one. I'll ask right. Thank uh, you. Uh, and we've, we've finished that, that question. Thanks very much. We're on to question eight. James Humphreys to Councillor Mike Danvers. Lisa, can you read this one out? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. With sales of electric and hybrid vehicles set to soar in the next few years, Due to the restrictions on new petrol and diesel only car sales in 2030, central government announced last January that £10 million in funding had been made available for the installation of charging points on residential streets and car parks in 2021. A recent Freedom of Information request found that 126 out of over 400 councils have no plans to fit any ahead of 2025. Harlow was not listed, although Essex as a whole responded with seven charging points. Local councils have been encouraged to use this £10 million fund in order to improve infrastructure and support a greener future for towns and cities 
as more and more people make the move to either hybrid or fully electric vehicles in Harlow. With a rapidly growing town and emphasis on greener transport used to support new housing development, do the council have any plans to use this fund in order to improve the electric vehicle infrastructure of this town to support greener initiatives? Thank you, Chair. Can you reply to that question, Councillor Danvers? Councillor Danvers? Um, I agree very much with you about how important this matter is. It is vital that the central government produce a national plan to enable local authorities to do this properly, rather than in a piecemeal fashion, which is their habit. The Transport Secretary announced in 2020 that government funding will be doubled to 10 million for the installation of charge points on residential streets for 2021. This could fund up to 3,600 charge points across the country and make charging of home and overnight easier for those without an off-street parking space. Current requests from residents for the installation on the street char charging points is very low. However, this is likely to increase in line with the forthcoming ban on petrol and diesel vehicles. Officers are currently exploring options to facilitate the delivery of the street residential charging points for public use in the states where there is sufficient demand. Officers are also working with Essex County Council, whose own, um, who own the majority of roadways within Harlow regarding on-street um, charging installations. An Essex-wide fund bid is currently being drafted as part of this work. In addition, the new adopted local development plan contains requirement for developers to consider installation of charge points as part of their future development schemes. Harlow Council declared a climate emergency in July 2019. And as part of that commitment, it has agreed to install electric charging points in its public pay and display car parks over the next five years where this is possible. Thank you, Councillor Danvers. Question nine from James Humphreys to Councillor Danvers. Lisa, can you read this one out? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Furthermore, again, with a rapidly growing town in mind, do Harlow Council have any targets on electric vehicle charging points for 2025 or even 2030 on streets and in its car parks to reduce the reliance on petrol and diesel cars in line with the other green transport initiatives. Can you reply to that, Councillor Danvers? I, th I think the, partly the, the, the answer was in the, in, the, in the last answer, but to add to that, a climate change emergency was declared by Harlow Council in July 2019, in which it committed to installing electrical vehicle charging points in all its public pay and display car parks over the next five years where this is possible. This work has already commenced and is due to be carried out within the timeline set. There are no existing targets on street charging, but officers are actively working with Essex County Council, who are responsible for the majority of roadways and associated infrastructure within Harlow. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Danvers. Okay, that's the end of the questions from the public. Item seven, questions from councillors. We have one question and it's from Councillor Mark Hardware to Councillor Ingle. Can you ask your question, Councillor Hardware? Chair, can uh, Mark Ingle tell us please, the level of infrastructure funding, which is section 106, 106 and uh, other developer contributions, the council has collected during the year 2019-2020 and what the money has been spent on. Reply from Councillor Ingle. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Hardware. Um, the amount of Section 106 developer contributions received by the Council in 2019-2020 was £511,653.17. This is broken down as follows. £433,357.75 held by Harlow Council for expenditure by NHS England and Essex County Council in respect of developer contributions towards healthcare and libraries. 
76,495 pounds and 42 pence held by Harlow Council for expenditure by the council on equipped children's playgrounds, playing fields, a town park and allotments. <clears throat> Proposals for how to utilise these funds to add value to existing council expenditure are currently being considered by the senior management board. £1,800 and no pence paid to Harlow Council as monitoring fees. Thank you. Thank you. Ingo. Uh, Councillor Hardware, do you have a supplementary? I do, yes please, Chair. Thank you. As uh, the leader is aware, the council is required to publish every year its annual infrastructure funding statement, which details all of the, uh, the monies it's collected, uh, the monies it holds, and what this is all for. Um, if you refer to the, the latest statement, which was published uh, later last year, uh, from which uh, these figures have been taken, uh, it says that absolutely none of this money has been spent. Not a penny. Nil. Could the leader tell us why? Can your question? I'll just ask, ask the leader why. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Councillor Hardware. I miss the end of it. Um, that's uh, a matter I'll have to take advice on, and I'll get back to you uh, in writing as soon as I possibly can. Thank you, Councillor. OK, now we have finished with the questions. We now come on to item eight, motions from councillors. And this is the adoption of Tony Pagoni at a hate crime. Um, proposer is Councillor Emma Toole and seconded by Councillor Chris Vince. Councillor Emma Toole, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd like to move it and I'd like to move um, with a slight amendment that the councillors should have had beforehand. So just on uh, the first point under the council resolves to remove the first point and change it to um, to write to the Law Commission in favour of strengthening hate crime legislation and making misogyny a hate crime. Right, okay. And I think that's seconded, that amendment is sent it, with, with the motion is uh, by Chris. Can't yeah, I'll second, I'll second that, um, that amendment, sorry, yeah. Right, okay. So and do you I want accept to my own amendment, so. Right, okay. So do you want to speak on that amendment or you want to no, go No, no, that? no, that's fine. I just just, just to uh, uh, apologise uh, to full council, but also um, to thank the chair and our councillors for allowing me to delay the motion from uh, December to January. I was, I was unwell and unable to attend the December meeting, but it did mean the um, closing date for the official submissions was the 24th. Yeah. I suggest to change that in line with that. Right, okay. So um, do you want to um, talk on this motion? Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thank you, everyone. Um, as, as I said, thanks again for everyone for delaying um, from December. I do appreciate it. Um, the current legislation around uh, hate crime is has a massive glaring hole in terms of not covering misogyny um, as the current legislation. And it's something that's been highlighted by a number of campaigners um, over the years. Um, I think there's been some really positive steps forward. Um, in 2015, Nottinghamshire Police Force were the very first to recognise, uh, decide to re recognise misogyny as a hate crime themselves. Um, and, and from all accounts, they said this made a huge difference and actually was very successful. Uh, Sue Fish, the retired uh, chief, uh, chief police, uh, police chief in Nottinghamshire, said that it had a huge impact on trust between police and women and that women generally felt safe, uh, safer in public spaces because they were able to report crimes when they'd experienced them. Um, since 2018, uh, Stella Creasy, uh, Labour MP for Walthamstow, and a range of other fantastic campaign organisations um, have won. They did win a huge campaign to secure a national law, the National Law Commission Review, uh, which is the ex expert body responsible for reviewing legal framework, framework on hate crime uh, protections. Um, this is ran last year. It closed on Christmas Eve and is due to report to the government um, this year. And I hope that their proposals will be accepted. Um, they found that actually it was a huge gaping hole in the legislation and that the majority of people did support to include misogyny as a hate crime. Um, the proposals from the Law Commission should be welcomed. And I hope we can do just that as a council tonight. Um, as the MP Senator Creasy said, this is a huge our moment for change. Um, hate motivated gender uh, Hate crime motivated by gender is already a factor in nearly 33% of all crime on existing hate crimes. It's just not recognised and recorded formally by most police forces. Um, 
And according to YouGov, 85% of women um, aged between 18 and 24 have experienced sexual harassment in public. This is a huge amount. Um, and this is actually, um, absolutely disgraceful, actually, 85% of women experience that. I think most women that I spoke to can't even remember, I can't personally can't remember the first time that I'd experienced sexual harassment in public because it happened so often in my teenage years that I just wouldn't even know to begin where to pinpoint with that. Um, one of the big issues with hate crime, and I've experienced it myself when I moved uh, when I moved a motion a few years back uh, with the council, in terms of um, actually changing the title of chair um, and and around uh, gender pay pay uh, claims in the council. Now, whether you agree or disagree with that, that's absolutely a fair debate to be had, and, and that. But what is not fair is the two thousand tweets I received after the week the weekend after, um, including uh, debating whether I was rapeable or not and whether I was worth it and whether that would fix my opinions and change my opinions on it. I had to turn my phone off, turn all my other stuff, my passwords to friends and family members so that I couldn't, couldn't didn't have to read the stuff that was being discussed because it just started to flood through and the notifications were constant. Um, the internet, unfortunately, has made it a very unsafe place for women quite often. Um, and actually, when I reported it myself, um, misogyny wasn't recognised um, as a hate crime. I actually had to push Essex Police to record it as a hate crime at all. When I first went uh, by myself, um, I was turned away um, at the front desk. Um, and actually I was in a position where the council chief exec at the time and the leader of the council took it up with police um, themselves to take it on and to report it and to, to record that. Um, but not everyone is in that privileged situation and it shouldn't be something that's turned away. It should absolutely be recorded when it is a hate crime. Um, the police then asked me, even though that I had supplied all the screenshots, wanted me to type up a document with every single tweet in that was said. And the police officer, even though repeatedly after visiting me, repeatedly said, I can give you the screenshots. So that wasn't acceptable. I wasn't able to post that at the time and I actually stopped the complaint and I didn't pursue it further because it just wasn't accessible. Um, six in 10 minutes into hate crime said they've never reported hate crime at all. And it's something for, that we need to look at massively. Um, seven police forces in England and Wales have classified hate misogyny as a hate crime already, but this definition is not across, uh, accepted across the board. Um, and unfortunately, and very disappointingly, Essex is not one of those police forces that recognises it. Um, the mayors of London, Manchester, Liverpool and Sheffield have all come out in favour of, of this campaign. Um, and I'm hoping that tonight Harlow Council can add itself to that list of people that are supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Toll. Councillor Vince, do you want you to speak now or to reserve your um, right to speak later? I'll reserve my right to speak later, Chair. Thank you. So we um, come to the debate. Councillors. Uh, Chair, there doesn't seem to be any councillors that wish to speak. OK, so now um, we'll go to the agreement then. Um, Bearing in mind the um, amendment to um, the, the, the council notes, uh, item one of that, and then the um, council resolves one to three. Do we agree with this motion? Oh, Councillor Vince, do you wish to um, speak now? Um, I won't say a lot, Chair. Obviously, I completely support this motion and I welcome, by the sounds of things, the desire of this council to do everything in its power um, to get this legislation changed and support. Um, you know, people in our society who have experienced hate crime and, and, and previously haven't had it um, recognised as such. And I think um, I'm sure that the, 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 the um, information that, that um, Councillor Toll provides with um, was, was quite shocking for me personally, and I'm sure a lot of other people on this call. Um, and it is awful that she had to go through that and, and other people have had to go through that. And I, I welcome this motion and I welcome this council supporting it. Thank you. OK. And, and Councillor Toll, do you want to sum up? Uh, no, just to thank everyone and, and apologies for this coming on the Budget Council. I know I normally try and avoid motions, so I do appreciate um, it being taken tonight. Thank you. Right, so councillors, do we all agree with this motion? Agreed. 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 Yeah. Excellent. Agreed. Thank you. Now we come on to item nine, references from Cabinet and Committees. Um, now, um, proposer on this is Councillor Ingle. Councillor Shears, you've got your hand up. Hello? She hasn't, Chair. Oh, OK. Right. <laughs> OK. I thought it was a bit unusual. OK, so the proposer on this um, motion is um, Councillor Mark Ingle. I move the motion, Chair. And seconder, Councillor Danvers. I second, Chair. 
And do you wish to reserve your right to speak at this stage, Councillor Danvers? No. Okay. Right. And now, um, I believe we've got an amendment coming I soon. Think that's... No. no. Yes. The, the mover chair should uh, say what he wants to about the motion. Uh, the right, motion. Okay. Councillor Danvers, you want to speak now, yeah? No, it's sorry. Not. Mark speaks, then I speak, and then we have the right. amendment. That's what I thought. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Counts That's okay. Councillor Ingle, you're now speaking. Thank you, Chair. Um, this budget and associated papers is presented for council approval at a time of the greatest uncertainty. Much of that uncertainty stems from the tragic consequences of the worst viral disease to strike the world in a hundred years. However, some of that uncertainty can be laid firmly and squarely at an incompetent government that has attacked council budgets, devastating services that supported the most deserving in society, while inequality has soared. Like many other councils across the country, Harlow's Labour-led council has suffered from cuts to government support, which are now equivalent to £6.7 million per year. And over the last 10 years of Conservative government, a cumulative total of £56 million. If the government returned all of this money, it would be enough to give every single council taxpayer a five-year holiday from paying any Harlow council tax at all. At the same time as making these cuts to financial support, the government has asked councils to deliver more, and we have done. For example, stepping up to the mark to disperse government grants to businesses affected by COVID. Across the country, in the face of Conservative government hostility, councils of all political colours have been compelled to make emergency budgets. Harlow has not. Across the country, councils have been forced into making redundancies. Harlow has not. Across the country, councils have been forced to cut the services they provide. Harlow has not. This is the eighth successive year that this Labour-led council has balanced the books without being forced into making compulsory redundancies or cuts. Whilst the government limps from one crisis to another and is unable to plan its financial settlement for councils beyond a year, our sound financial management has meant that this Labour-led council has been able to stick to its medium-term financial strategy, ensuring stability and certainty. We do not make guesses. We do not stick our heads in the sand. We do not court short-term popularity by avoiding taking tough decisions. We plan, we make sensible long-term decisions, and we are careful with residents' money. As a measure of our success, even in these uncertain times, Harlow's Labour-led council has recently delivered 30 new, 32 new council homes. In our budget for next year, we've found room to put money aside to support those families who have been most affected by the financial effects of COVID. We've created a £1.36 million budget stabilisation fund to ensure stability for Harlow's residents in years to come. And we've made provision to protect respite services for the families of disabled children that Essex County Council had planned to hit with charges. Although conveniently, Essex County Council have delayed a decision on this until after the County Council elections in May. Thanks to our prudent use of scarce resources, our efficient use of council tax income and revenue provided from our own property and environment company, HTS, we have achieved this stability while only adding a predicted inflation only increase of 10 pence per week for a typical band C resident. No council tax increase is taken lightly, but let's take a moment to reflect on where recent council tax increases come from and what they mean for a typical Harlow resident. Harlow Council's proportion of a typical bill represents only 15% of the money collected from a Harlow resident. Over a four year period, Harlow Labour have increased residence bills for a band C property by £14.77 a year, an inflation only increase. Much of the rest of a typical council taxpayer's money is taken by Conservative controlled Essex County Council. In four years, they have increased their take for the same band C property by 
157 pounds and 52 pence per year. A resident will also have seen the Conservative Police Fire and Crime Commissioner take an additional £45.76 pence per year over four years. So since 2018-19, the Conservatives, in whatever guise from Essex, are taking a whopping inflation-busting additional £203.28 pence per year from a typical Harlow household, compared to £14.10 in additional council tax charged by Harlow as Labour-led council. Harlow Council have provided good value for money, and it is my pledge to residents that we will continue to provide good value for money. An enormous amount of work has gone into preparing this budget, not just this year, but in preceding years. That has put Harlow in the stable position it currently enjoys. Difficult decisions have been taken, brave choices made in the teeth of an opposition that have too often been shown simply to be wrong. I would like to thank our finance officer, Simon Freeman, and his team for the sage and expert advice that we have followed in preparing this budget. And I would strongly recommend to all councillors on both sides of the chamber that the expert advice should be listened to and acted on by agreeing this budget. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, Councillor Danvers, did you want to speak now? No. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I'd like right. to, uh, yes, I would. That already indicated right. that I would. Um, yep. Probably speaking as a seconder for the last time, probably, um, in this position. Um, the last nine years, I've been able to get together quite a, I think, quite a sound budget for Harlow Council, protecting its services, appreciating the work of, of the staff by actually showing them that, that we, we, we've been able to give them a salary increase increase in line uh, with inflation. We've been able to set monies aside in terms of our reserve accounts to actually face up to any unexpected eventualities. Given the way the government actually goes from one crisis to another as far as finance is concerned, we used to get nine million pounds worth of government grant. We now get under three million. So that's been the magnitude under the Tory government of what this authority has had to uh, bear up to. If we had been listening to the, the, the tourist opposition over the last nine years, we would have actually been without about one and a half million pounds worth of council tax. Year on year, if you freeze the council tax, that's the magnitude of the money that we now would have been without. And I'm sure tonight we're gonna to hear similar stories of freezing the council tax. In the long term, that's the economics of the madhouse. We've seen that with Tory Northampton County Council, and we're seeing that with Essex County Council. Essex County Council haven't really um, been able to bite the bullet in regards to sound finances. And that's why only last week they were producing a budget with 56, 46 million pounds worth of cuts to services if their services are diabolical as, as it is, just given the state of our roads as just one example, and 56 million pounds of borrowing, which will actually finance day-to-day -day expenditure. And as I say, that is the economics of the madhouse to be able to carry on like that. So I'm pleased to actually back all the things that Mark Ingle has said. We're setting aside far more money for the homeless because sadly, that's the state of play that we're finding ourselves in. We're setting aside £300,000 uh, to actually alleviate the problems of, of the unemployed. As from April, as people come out of the furlong, furlough system, we're going to see problems and we, we know that people may not be able to afford their council tax. So we're setting aside an additional £300,000 as a hardship fund to be able to actually alleviate uh, that problem. Um, and therefore, Chair, I think this is, this is a sound budget and one that we can uh, make sure that balances the books for the next uh, three years at least, unlike what I've already seen of the Tory proposals. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Danvers. Now we'll come to the amendment that uh, is in the supplementary that you should always have received. And I understand that Councillor Russell Perrin is going to be the proposer. I am. And Councillor Andrew Johnson will be the seconder. Okay. Councillor Johnson, do you reserve your right to speak 
uh, uh, later or um, after? Yes, I'm happy to formally second and reserve, Chair. Okay, thank you. So, Councillor Perrin, it's over to you. Thank you, Chair. And I also would like to thank uh, the very same council officers who have also assisted me in putting together this uh, alternative budget. And we have listened to their advice and they have agreed that this is a balanced proposal and is the deliverable one. So we thank them also for their advice. What we're seeing tonight is a merely a difference of approach. The havoc that's been uh, wreaked by this pandemic is well documented and Councillor Ingall was right in saying that this is possibly the worst disease in 100 years. Many of our residents face an uncertain future, uh, uh, uncertain future, a time of financial hardship. Many will have lost their jobs. Many others will be anxious over their job security and what the future holds. There will be heightened emotional distress caused by having to care for loved ones that are potentially suffering with this disease. I know a friend of mine, his brother, 35 years old, no underlying health conditions, spent many weeks on a ventilator owing to this disease, and his story is not unique. There have been many more who have not been as fortunate and made it like he did. So there are many grieving families in our town as well. Despite my many demonstrations over the past five years that the counter tax rise could be avoided whilst protecting much loved council services, we could have always put that down to a difference of approach or outlook. But to push ahead with a council tax rise now is simply mean. Mean to rise a tax when it affects so many at a time of such hardship. And that is why I've shown yet again that it's possible to cut council tax. And that is why I'm proposing cutting council tax by 1.99% to reverse the mean and insensitive burden that's being placed upon the people of this town. Much is often made of other authorities and what they are doing, but we have to be concerned with what we have control of over here in Harlow. And we have our hands on the levers of power here in Harlow, and we have the power to help. And the Labour administration has chosen not to. However, like any responsible opposition, there are aspects we do agree on. We do agree with the hardship fund, supporting those who will be unable or struggling to pay their council tax at a time of immense financial hardship. However, we've gone further and we have shown that we can create a larger fund in the reserves, which is indeed what we have done. This on top of the one million pound given to support um, councils with people who cannot pay their council tax by the Conservative government goes a long way in showing that we do care and we are able to support those that are unable to help themselves at this time. In this budget, I have taken also into account the impact that this pandemic is having upon the education of the children in our town. That is why I've proposed the reintroduction of the STEM Learning Reserve. I do note that many of the initiatives that the STEM Learning Reserve set out to achieve, which I moved, um, last year, uh, two years ago now, and I was grateful that got cross-party support in the chamber, have continued for existing revenue in the Regeneration and Enterprise Zone Department. But this extra money we are setting aside to increase the level of provision and support at this time. Along with the cut to council tax, the provision of the hardship fund and education we have matched the administration pound for pound in the discretionary services fund, showing that it is still possible to protect much life services such as Pets Corner, the museum, and, and many other much loved frontline services, as well as supporting back office functions. How have we paid for this? We have used revenue income to do this. We have not raided the reserves. The administration is using £300,000 of its new budget stabilisation reserve to fund the pressure in the general fund. We have not needed to do this. We have used this all from income. So we haven't had to use the credit card even at this time. I'm moving this Conservative amendment that supports every resident by cutting council tax. We are providing more to support those who cannot pay their council tax. 
We are investing in our children's education when it has suffered from much disruption owing to this pandemic. We are still continuing to protect much of our frontline services such as Pets Corner and the museum. This budget is on the side of the people of this town at a time when they most need it. And therefore I commend it to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perrin. Okay, now we come to the debate. Uh, of point of order, um, uh, 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 point of information, Chair, please. Right, Councillor Ingle. Um, Twice in, and, and, and I may be reading this wrong, but twice in Councillor Perrin's um, speech there, he spoke about cutting council tax and cutting council tax by 1.99%. I think if I'm, unless I'm mistaken, their mm. alternative budget doesn't propose a cutting council no. tax. It proposes a freeze in council tax. Does mm. Councillor Perrin not understand his own budget or is he trying to mislead residents? Right, okay, Councillor Perrin, can you answer that question, please? Uh, I can, it's not usual for the opposition to answer questions, that's more of an administration thing. But yeah, by way of illustration, I was using Councillor Ingalls' logic that he expressed at Cabinet only last week, where right. he said a freeze is as good as a cut in real terms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, okay, Doug. <laughs> So uh, you've answered the question, Councillor Perrin, yes? Right, okay. So. Okay, just check in. Okay, mm. now come on to the debate on the amendment. Councillors, up to you. Yep, can I go? Y yes. All right, okay. Lisa, uh, you're, you're on mute. You're Councillor on Danny Purton is first. Oh, right. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, yeah. Chair and Lisa. Uh, <laughs> the solid foundation of this budget going forward gives us the platform for confidence in a bright future for Harlow. Once we emerge from the nightmare of incompetence under Boris the Bungler, we are poised to okay. move ahead rapidly. We have Public Health England moving into town with the associated research and development med tech companies. We are looking to a 21st century health campus, commencement of the first strategic housing sites at Gilston, and the opening of the UK's fastest supercomputer, which is to be used among other things for vaccine development. These are just a few of the highlights that will be our future in Harlow. Compare this with the downbeat, backward-looking approach of the opposition, summed up by their contention at recent meetings that Harlow is just a small town. Even in the depths of the Thatcher onslaught on our local economy back in the 80s, we were never just a small town. We've always been a great town, admired both nationally and internationally. And given the plans for the garden town, we are once again attracting national attention with our top quality standards for placemaking, training and skills and sustainable transportation. We're also developing future proposals with our local partners for a wider garden city economic zone, which will form the central core of the London to Cambridge Innovation Corridor. All these exciting plans for the future of our community will no doubt be opposed, as usual, by the Tory group opposite. They have no strategic vision for the future of the town, as revealed by these pathetic amendments. The Tory group opposite are in fact irrelevant to the future of our community, which I'm sure will be reflected in the outcome of the forthcoming local elections whenever they are held. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any more councillors? Councillor Stephen Mullard. Councillor Mullard. 
Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, there's some year, some things every year I look forward to. I look forward to Christmas. I look forward to Easter. I look forward to my birthday. But most of all, the thing I look forward to the most is laughing at the Tories' amended budget. This amended budget is once again short-sighted, irresponsible and puts at risk the vital services that Harlow residents care about so much. But I do have a planned speech that I'll come back to, but I'm just going to go off my speech a little bit here. It's a little bit hypocritical of a Tory councillor to talk about education and school funding and about how he wants to protect it. Let's take it. Let's take his own school of stewards. I just did a little bit of research in the two minutes I had an eight hundred and eight thousand and forty two pound lost. And I can read my numbers correctly, unlike some ministers, eight hundred and eight thousand and forty two pound loss shortfall at Stewards Academy in the next coming year. That works out at £752 per pupil. That school is short and that is the school he works on. So I will not take lectures in this virtual chamber from a Tory teacher saying that he wants to protect education. It is hypocritical and it is wrong. But I'll come back to the amendment. This year, the Labour administration will be presenting a budget that protects frontline services, offers vital support to people with the most need and also recognises the amazing work that our staff have done in the last 12 months. And what does this amendment offer? A three year ticking time bomb. Yes, he's balanced the budget for the MTF, but he has not balanced it any further than that. In three years time, he will have to pick what beloved service he closes. And when he gets to speak again, maybe he'll tell us which one, which one of the P's it is. Will it be Pets Corner, the Playhouse or the Paddling Pools? Because he'll have to close one of them because his mitigation fund will run out. So instead of quick headlines, maybe Councillor Perrin can actually present something useful next year instead of something that has all the hallmarks of being written on the back of a cigarette packet. I will not be voting for this amendment, Chair. Thank you. Right. Other councillors? Councillor Tony Durkin, Chair. Councillor Durkin. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Liz. And I'm not sure how I'm going to follow Stefan because one of my key points was I did find it uh, extraordinary that, well, to be honest, I couldn't see any difference between what we're saying and what you've tried to say, because actually the vast majority of it is exactly the same. So you're just pulling at bits that don't seem to make any sense or realistic. I agree with Stefan about education. We shouldn't be looking at the STEM fund. We should be holding the government to account for their complete and utter disaster in dealing with education, not just in Harlow, but in the whole of, of the UK. Our MP, who is actually the chair of the Education Committee, should be hanging his hand, head in shame over these particular issues. So I don't understand genuinely what the fundamental difference is between what you have proposed compared to what Mark has said that seems very reasonable, very fair, very reflective and is cost affordable. And absolutely, Stefan is right. The only difference I can think out, which is where we were a number of years ago when your predecessor, Joel Charles, put this, is we're putting discretionary services at risk yet again. And you know we've all been injured by that long war that we had. And it's absolutely right that these services that are loved and voted for by our community are solid, reliable and sustainable. So I just want to finish with a quote from an Irish philosopher that I think summarises my view over this particular issue. He's a young lad called Ronan Keating, who's a philosopher, poet and apparently a quite a nice chap, who once was quoted as say, uh, you say it best when you say nothing at all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Any other councillors wish to comment on this amendment? Councillor Tony yeah. Edwards. Mr. Edwards. Before um, coming to the meeting tonight, I had a look at uh, your Harlow and I looked at the, uh, the Conservative sort of statement in your Harlow in which they, they say uh, Harlow Council set to raise Council tax again, but Conservatives show it could be cut. And what concerned me about that 
is that, that this particular article has gone out and it's gone out to the to the people of Harlow. And it's full of what I can only call deceit, really, which I feel is such a shame in terms of the politics within the town. It would be so much better if instead of deceit, we actually had some honest debate within the town. Yes, there's enormous problems facing all of us if we, on, on, on whichever political party. And uh, in, in terms of where we are, in terms of both in terms of COVID and in terms of balancing the books, this is a serious debate. So for them to start in that debate by saying, this marks the eighth increase in council tax in the last nine years, costing average residents hundreds of pounds a year extra. Well, that's a lie for a start. We heard from Mark Ingle over the last, last four years, the, uh, it's gone up in line with inflation. It's cost 14 pounds and 10 pence per year over the last four years. The council tax rise that we're talking about now, as I understand it, is approximately 10 pence a week or five pounds, 10 pence or, or just over five pounds for a year for a family. This is not for an individual. This is for, you know, across, across houses for all the residents. So it's, it's a, a minimal amount of money is what we're, we're, we're discussing. It's not hundreds of pounds. In terms of, they, um, so it then goes on to um, make a statement and said, uh, um, sorry, our old, sorry, for too long, Harlow Council have wasted our money and hiked our council tax. As I've said earlier, there's no evidence that we've hiked the council tax above inflation. There's no mention in there, in the report that's gone into your hollow about the, cap, the cut, which we're, we're way back in 2010, we were receiving something like nine million pounds, nine and a half million pounds, 9.7 million pounds in support from the government. And we're now receiving in support from the government uh, for next year, going forward about 2.95 million pounds, three million pounds. So effectively, six million pounds lost in government support over the years. So, and he, he talks, and, and he, he, then go, they, he then goes on to say they've wasted our money, hiked our council tax, then goes on to say they want to spend a hundred million pounds on a monorail. No, we don't. At the moment, we want to do a feasibility study looking at all of the issues, and it's not a monorail anyway, looking at all, the, all of the issues and, and, and it, to install some sustainable transport within the town. He then says they lost 10 million pounds in regeneration of the town centre. No, we didn't. We were invited to put in an application for a bid for, for funding. It was a competitive bid. A whole lot of towns got it. It's interesting that towns like Newark, where the environment, uh, environmental secretary appears to have uh, got far less uh, uh, problems than we face within the Harlow, seem to have got some money out of it, but we as a council didn't. But we've yet to see the reason, we've yet to be told why it wasn't we were unsuccessful there. But we certainly didn't lose anything, we just didn't gain from that particular bid. And then they then go on to say, we failed to distribute government business grants to local businesses. That's factually untrue and should be withdrawn. We, 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 we've given out, and no doubt the officers can tell you, we've given out millions of pounds of government grant to businesses. And uh, so I just wish that in terms of having a debate, as I say, I wish it could have been done in terms of an honest debate. We're actually, and as I say, in terms of the, the overall budget, it's a difference of 10p a week. That's what we're talking about. And it's being blown up as if it's some massive imposition that we're, that we're basing. All we, as a, all we as a party are attempting to do is to make certain that we can preserve the jobs and the services that we currently provide. That's what we're trying to do here. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, any more councillors wish to speak on this amendment? No, Councillor, no one has their hands up. Andrew right. Johnson, apologies, Councillor Andrew Johnson. Okay, Councillor Johnson. 
Thank you, Chair. Yes, I did reserve my right to speak as seconder of the uh, of the amendment. Yeah. Um, can I start, Chair, by also thanking the officers of the council for supporting my group uh, in putting together uh, an opposition budget? Now, it has been noted tonight, Chair, that it's a light opposition budget, and it is, uh, and that was purposeful. Uh, purposeful for a number of reasons. Firstly, we understand the incredible pressures. Uh, that the officers are under in what is unprecedented times of this pandemic. And I assured the chief executive uh, earlier in the electoral cycle this year um, that we would not be moving a comprehensive um, opposition budget. I look forward to doing a full star chamber process and uh, a full uh, budget once we take control of the council after the local elections. But at the moment, knowing that the administration would automatically vote anything we said tonight, no matter how sensible and no matter how serious down, um, we decided not to burden the officers with overwhelming work. That being said, the officers have been, as ever, courteous, helpful, uh, and uh, very friendly in working with us, and I thank them for that. Chair, we're facing this pandemic that we all know about. Uh, it's the reason we're holding a virtual meeting. It's the reason that, sadly, a number of us have lost uh, friends and family members or relatives. Um, and... I don't think tonight is the time for either side to be self-congratulatory about politics. And sadly, that's what I've already heard tonight. People joking and laughing about, um, you know, political bashing. Um, I could have taken bets that Thatcher would have been mentioned very quickly by the uh, administration, as they seem to do. It's 40 years ago today she came to Harlow to visit uh, Pitney Bowes. Um, and I'm reminded despite the fact that the administration mentioned her all the time, I'm reminded of um, a, a quote from her uh, about taxation, and that is, it's your tax which pays for public spending. The government, or local government, have no money of their own, only taxpayers' money. And I think, Chair, that's really important for us to remember tonight. The money that we are debating and the spend that we are debating is taxpayers' money and taxpayers' money alone. It doesn't belong to Harlow Council. It doesn't belong to the government. It belongs to hardworking taxpayers. And so tonight, Chair, I asked my budget team, I asked Councillor Perrin, I asked my group to come up with a, an alternative budget that showed one thing, at least one thing, and that is that we would be willing to freeze council tax at this time, a real-term cut, uh, in real terms, as Councillor Ingle mentioned on Cabinet last week, that we would provide a council tax freeze to support not just the poorest in society, who we're happy to support through the hardship fund, who we're happy to put more money into the hardship fund than the Labour Council, um, to support anyone who cannot pay their council tax, but to support, Chair, those squeezed middle that make up the majority of Harlow, people who are working hard but still finding it hard at the end of the day to pay all of their bills. And I think at this time, Chair, with so many people furloughed, with so many people taking 80% of their wages, with so many people struggling, I think it is inappropriate of the council to put an additional council tax burden on those Harlow council taxpayers. And so that, Chair, is why we're moving a council tax freeze tonight. Now, I fully expect the Labour administration to vote this down, Chair, to continue to make jokes and, uh, and take the mick about very serious issues. Uh, and I think being able to pay your bills at the end of the day is a very serious issue. And I'm not just interested in supporting just the poorest in society like this administration seems to do. I want to support the whole of Harlow. And the way the council can do that tonight, Chair, is by voting for this amendment to freeze the council tax for the next year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Any more councillors? Councillor Danvers. Yeah, Councillor Danvers has already spoken. He's already spoke. You're, you're no, going, Chair, he, he spoken hasn't spoken on the, on the amendment. amendment. He hasn't Chair. spoken on the amendment. No, on the amendment, no. That's correct. Thank you, Chair. I'm only going to speak briefly. A third of the Conservative group that we have tonight have already voted at Essex County Council to put up the council tax by a large amount. The police commissioner, Roger Hurst, a Conservative, is putting up both the, the police element and the fire element by a very large amount, far, far more than is being suggested by Harlow Council. Harlow Conservatives really need to get their act together. Councillor Souter, Councillor Hardware, uh, Councillor Johnson Senior and Councillor Garnet all put their hands up last week to actually vote for a much, much larger council increase at Essex County Council on the people of Harlow 
than the Labour administration are going to be putting up their hands tonight. I would like to ask councillors Hardware, Johnson, Garnet, and Souter, why aren't they participating in this debate? Why are they saying that they're actually pulling up Harlow taxes by a great deal, which, yes, they're Harlow taxpayers' money for Essex County Council and not for Harlow services? Why the double standards from one third of the Conservative group? Thank you, Councillor Danvers. Okay, is this the end of the debate? No, Chair, I need to summarise. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I was getting to that, Councillor Ingo. I was just making sure the Councillor that wanted to speak could. Okay, so if you can sum up, Councillor Ingalls. Okay, apologies, Chair. Um, let me start by thanking Councillor Perrin and the Conservatives for the great compliment they've shown us tonight by recognising the enormous good sense our budget represents. If imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, then their alternative budget, which is 97% a copy of ours, is flattery indeed. And we can see just how much of our budget they've accepted by looking at the documents. Here's ours. I'll hold it up sideways. 240 pages of detailed notes. Here's theirs. Two sides of A4. Um, theirs is a back of a fag packet alternative. Point of order, Chair, 16.5G. Carry on, Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Uh, I believe Councillor Ingle isn't holding up the whole of our uh, budget process. We also have those 200 odd pages. And I think I explained during my speech exactly what we were doing and why we were doing it to support officers and to support the town. OK, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Ingle, carry on. There are three pages that were submitted by the Tories. Um, I'm going to continue. But the differences in those three pages are important and they need to be addressed as those are differences allow the Tories to pretend they can deliver sustainability without the need to raise Harlow's proportion of the council tax by the 10 pence a week um, that we propose for a typical council taxpayer. But the truth is they can't. And that's the start of their deceit. And we've heard much of that tonight. Three deceits I'll draw your attention to. Councillor Perrin twice talking about a council tax cut. He didn't say a real terms council tax cut. He said a council tax cut. They don't propose a council tax cut. That was dishonest. They spoke about no raid on reserves. And yet, Chair, they're balancing this budget by um, using new homes bonus money um, and other reserves to top up the discretionary fund that they're taking the money from. Another deceit. They talk about a balanced budget. Now, that's a fairly clever deceit because it's deceit by omission. Yes, they ask the uh, finance officers um, whether they're... Clarification, please, Chair. Uh, point of clarification. I don't think there is a point of clarification in the standing orders. Point of information. You, you had one when I was speaking. Yeah, um, that was the point bonus, of, that was the point of bonus is not a reserve. It's an income stream. OK, can we uh, carry on, Councillor Ingle? And I said they are using reserves to top up the discretionary fund, um, which is losing money from the new homes bonus uh, funds. And we'll remember that the new homes bonus fund is likely to be lost in the next two years anyway. And he spoke about a balanced budget. And yet there he's deceiving by omission, because, yes, he asked the question, is our budget balanced over a period of three years? And the answer was yes. But then he admitted the second part, the second part that is, and thereafter, there is a very serious shortfall in council income that will affect services. The alternative budget that Conservatives present tonight is reckless. In paying for ongoing expenses by creating a three year fund for one off payments like the new homes bonus, payments that are likely to disappear within a very few years, they create a financial crisis in years to come, calculated by our finance officers of half a million pounds by 2024, 2025. Is their budget sustainable? Only in the short term. They've been warned actually that their approach carries significant risk in the longer term and they've recklessly ignored that advice. The alternative budget the Conservatives present tonight takes no notice of the prevailing economic circumstances and uncertainties. The government are looking to make further cuts to council support and can provide no certainty about future funding. 
Now is not the time to use guesses and a finger in the air approach in the hope that things might somehow turn out right. The public are sick to the back teeth of conservatives, ignoring expert advice, over promising, and then looking to blame others when their unsustainable plans come crashing down. The alternative budget the Conservatives present tonight, like so many of the Harlow Conservative proposals in recent years, is financially illiterate. If we'd followed Harlow Conservatives' advice since they were last in power in Harlow, the council would be facing a cumulative loss of income from council tax of £4.25 million. If we'd listened to the Conservatives when they opposed the creation of HDS, we would have missed out on a further benefit of £2.7 million. Yes, councillors, Conservative proposals, since they were last in power, would have cost this council the eye-watering sum of £7 million. Last year, the Conservatives presented a budget that would have resulted, according to our financial expert financial advice, in a black hole in just three years. This year, they've done slightly better. The financial black hole will not appear for maybe four years. We cannot plan for the bright future Harlow deserves with such dark clouds forming on the horizon. That, councillors, is why, while we thank the opposition for their efforts, the only grown-up, sensible option is to vote down their thin alternative budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ingle. OK, um, now we'll um, come to the um, vote and um, Count Simon Hill, our officer, will do the roll call on that vote. Thank you, uh, Simon. Thank you, Chair. Um, as members may um, realise, the, uh, the set of regulations from 2014, so any votes on the budget are required to be by recorded vote. Uh, um, apologies, Mr Hill is sounding like a Dalek. I don't know if that's me or if that's everyone. No, it's Simon, got... Simon. It's everyone, but it got better by the end. I think that's because everybody is um, unmuting and it's all ricocheting back as it does on occasion, possibly. I could be wrong. Mm. Right, carry on, Simon. Sorry. You came in OK at the end. Is that better, Chair? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. That's, sorry about that. There's a set of regulations from 2014 that requires um, any vote on the budget uh, to be by recorded vote. So you're voting on the Conservative amendment. So you may vote for the amendment, ab against the amendment or abstain. I'll call members in order. Uh, Councillor David Carter. Four. Councillor Charles. Four. Councillor Churchill. Four. Councillor Clark. Um, you're on mute, Jean. Jean, you're on mute. Jean, you're on mute, my love. <laughs> Come off your mute. Ah, you, you're off. No. Oh, no. <laughs> you can be on, Jean. Oh. Oh. No, you're still on mute. That's it. Don't <laughs> touch it. <laughs> Can I suggest that she's there? Right. What's that like? That's yeah. fine. Just mm. Go with it. <laughs> Against. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Danvers. Like keep you in suspense. Against. Councillor Davis. Against. Councillor Dunn. Against. Councillor Durkin. Against. Councillor Edwards. Against. Councillor Garnet. Four. Councillor Hardware. Four. Councillor Harvey. Against. Councillor Hawkoop. Abstain. Councillor Ingle. Against. Councillor Jezard. Against. Councillor Andrew Johnson. Four. Councillor Eddie Johnson. Four. Councillor Shona Johnson. Four. Councillor Livings. Four. Councillor Mullard. Against. Councillor Perrin. Four. Councillor Purton. Against. Councillor Shears. Against. Councillor Souter. Four. Councillor Strachan. Against. Councillor Toll. 
Against. Against. Councillor Vince. Against. Councillor Waite. Against. Councillor Watson. Against. I make that 11 for 17 against and one abstention. Okay, so that amendment has fallen. Thank you, Simon. Okay, now we come back to the main debate and that's um, item 9A to F. So, um, councillors, it's your turn again to um, start the debate. Thank you. No councillors want to debate? Uh, yes, Councillor Chris Vince, Chair. Thank you, thank you. Oh, just me, okay. <laughs> um, I was gonna say we'll go home early, but of course we are all at home. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to refer, refer very briefly to um, Appendix B, page 66 of obviously the pack um, that you received, which is um, with reference to um, Sam's place. Um, the leader of the council was somewhat stole my thunder on this and, and mentioned this in his opening remarks, but I will just very briefly um, cover it. Many of you, I'm sure all of you know, what a wonderful um, service Sam's Place provides and what a wonderful um, place it is for young people with, with disabilities, some, some very severe, that, where they can have social interaction and planned activities, cooking and healthy and eating, arts and crafts, gardening, um, physical and sporting activities uh, and music lessons. And also I'd like to say uh, publicly a thanks to the staff of Sam's Place um, for their support of those people during lockdown um, doing welfare checks, checking that they're all right. So I thank them for that. And, and, and also the staff of Leah Manning for, for, for something similar. Um, as you may know, it is funded for a tendering process from Essex County Council. And obviously we've been successful uh, in, in bidding for that, for, for that money. Sadly, um, over the course of last summer, Essex County Council attempted to change the, uh, the, the funding of this uh, and force us to uh, charge, uh, res charge, um, users of this service um, for it. Something that we as an administration, and I hope the opposition will agree with me, um, fundamentally uh, disagree with. Their argument is that this is a service that costs uh, residents outside Harlow. Um, it's an argument I absolutely despise. Uh, the argument that uh, we've got something you haven't, so we shouldn't have it is out of order as far as I'm concerned. And actually other, my view is other local authorities need to find that funding. Uh, this argument has been dropped until September. Um, Councillor Ingalls suggested quite cynically that, that potentially this was uh, because it's after the election. I, I'm not going to get into that really. Um, but I, this administration believes that charging parents and carers of disabled children for respite, respite care is morally wrong. Um, and I have, uh, I'm sure, and I hope that opposition members would, would, would agree with me, particularly those that are on the County Council, and will fight Harlow's um, corner on this. Um, you know, we want the best for Harlow, we want the best for young people in Harlow, and particularly want the best for these really vulnerable young people. So I thank uh, Councillor Danvers for taking that into account and, uh, and, in, and the officers as well, and incorporating that as part of their budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vince. Other councillors? Councillor Eugenie Harvey. Councillor Harvey? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, highlight again, I know we've talked about the hardship fund, which is an important uh, component of our budget. And I just think it's important um, in light of the discussion about or debate around um, the freeze of council tax and the opposition's um, view that that is something that would be desirable. Um, and I just wanted to make sure it was really clear that the point of the hardship fund is to target those residents of whom there are tragically a growing number who are struggling with their bills and who will have problems with council tax. And that fund is targeted um, at that particular need. And also um, in having the conversation around the council tax problem that they may be facing, um, officers will take look at other areas of their expenditure, for example, are they having issues with their rent? Um, are there other 
are there other um, problems that, that the council can support them with? Can we signpost them to other services like Harlow Save, which we've also supported to make um, uh, support, financial support available to residents? So I think it's just really important to make very, very clear that although um, there is a very small increase in the Harlow Council portion of the council tax, um, we absolutely recognise that there is immense hardship out there and we have put this mechanism in place to address that. But what I think is so important about this is it means that we haven't um, used a very uh, large hammer to crack, if not a small nut, not the biggest nut. And by that I mean there are many people in our town who are fortunate enough to be well able to afford their council tax payment. And I don't think it's right that the town is deprived of that revenue, of that income, because if we don't uh, earn it, we don't bring it in, it's gone forever. And that is money that we need in order to provide vital services for the whole town and for those people who are in the greatest need. So I just think it's really important to highlight that we have built in a mechanism for addressing the hardship, for supporting those, not just through council tax, but through other, other areas, and also ensuring that we um, do uh, make very prudent financial um, commitments through um, requiring those who can pay council tax to, to pay it. And, um, you know, I, I feel perfectly comfortable with that. I think it is the right thing. Um, I'm, I'm proud to, to have that in our budget. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Um, other councillors? Chair, um, Councillor Perrin would like to raise a question under Standing Order 11.14. Councillor Perrin? Thank you, Chair. I, I'd like to ask a question to uh, Councillor Danvers. Um, it relates to page 57 of the general fund papers in table one. I'll allow time to get to the paper. So I can't actually see him on my screen at the moment. Councillor Danvers, if you can let me know when you've got there and then I can uh, carry on with the question. Which one? Page 57 of the General Fund Papers, looking at Table 1. Yes. Yeah, you're there. It shows a figure of £300,000 uh, being used to support um, the pressures of COVID, uh, the perceived pressures of COVID over the next financial year. And that's being brought in from the um, budget stabilisation reserve. Now, if you go to page 67 of the same report, Appendix C, and you look under the budget stabilization reserve line, it shows no use of that reserve over the course of the same financial year. So I just wondered if you'd be kind enough to explain um, what the discrepancy is, please. What, what we're hoping for is that the government keep to their word and they actually provide the money that they actually said. Sulik last year said that every authority that missed out would actually be reimbursed by the government and we feel that the terms of the money that's lost from the car parks and other revenue in the forthcoming year will probably continue and in those circumstances we expect the government to actually keep their word if we don't then we'll have to actually look at that and that's where the reserves might come in but at the moment we know what this Tory government is like in terms of keeping its word. We've got a prime minister that doesn't really doesn't tell the truth half the time. But let's take the government at its word and let's hope that they actually reimburse us uh, for the money that we actually expect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Danvers. OK. Is that OK, Councillor Perrin? Um, 
I'd like the financial officer to write me a note afterwards because I believe that if they're showing it being used, it should be shown as being drawn down in the reserve. If it changes mid-year, then they will adjust later on, but it should show it if it's being used in the general fund. So I would like a, I'd like a note, please. Thank you. Point okay. of order. Yeah. Councillor Ingle. Um, it's my, my understanding that questions of this sort of technical in-depth nature were best asked at Cabinet last week when all of these documents were presented to the, uh, the, uh, the Cabinet. Um, and this, this probably isn't the correct forum for this sort of questioning. We want to be open and transparent, but that opportunity passed last week. So I'm not allowed to ask questions understanding order on the budget papers? Uh, I'm not entering into a debate with you about standing mm -hmm. order right now. My understanding is that technical questions of the nature that you just asked would have been best presented in um, Cabinet last week when you had the papers. Could Simon Hill just clarify that for me, please? Yeah, because... I, was, I was just going to ask that, yeah. Councillor Perry, that, that um, Simon clarifies that. At your discretion, Chair, uh, councillors can ask up to two questions under the standing order that Councillor Perry is um, quoting. Okay, so that therefore means that um, Officer Simon Freeman will then um, respond in writing, yes? Yes, I'll arrange for that to happen, Chair. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Okay, so we'll go on with the debate. Councillors? Councillor Tony Edwards. Okay, Councillor Edwards. Just very briefly, Chair. I'm old enough to remember when Sam's Place was first introduced, uh, and it was at Kingsmore House. Um, I'm just trying to remember the decade now, 1970s, if I remember rightly, 1970s or early 80s at the latest. And it was a, at that time, um, it was a, a beacon, really, in terms of the way that support should be provided or was being provided and should be provided for um, children with disabilities. And, um, uh, and we, in, as, a, as a council, were leaders in terms of the uh, provision for people with disabilities and particularly children with disabilities. Um, subsequently, it's gone on and it's developed, but it's always remained and, and um, um, it, but it's always been perceived as a free service. Now, I hope that very, very much hope that we, in a cross party way, can very much support the proposal to Essex County Council. It's been free to service users all of that time. And I, I very much hope that all of the county council, the, the, the currently conservative county council, county councillors, who knows after the election, hopefully some Labour county councillors too, will be, will be very much um, pushing the uh, county council to say that this should continue as a free service to the people of Harlow. And, uh, and, and, and I, would, I would equally hope that those conservative, those conservative councillors who aren't county councillors um, perhaps would, with us, very much go forward in terms of a proposal to the County Council that this must remain a free service. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Any other councillors? Councillor Tony Durkin, Chair. Councillor Tony Durkin. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. As the Cabinet Member for uh, Prosperity and Growth, can I uh, welcome this budget and certainly thank you. Thanks to all the officers and the Labour team who put together uh, this very sensible and doable uh, budget. I did note uh, Councillor Danvers said that this may be his last opportunity to set a budget and if that's the case I would like to personally thank him for all his efforts that have occurred over the many years that he's held this uh, portfolio. Uh, in my portfolio business wants stability, uh, they want to work with a council that is well managed, well run, effective, supportive but also equally flexible 
to meet the changes and demands that are under normal times uh, expected. Uh, but I also want to agree completely with what Andrew Johnson said in, in his speech that I think we've got to be realistic and we've got to be honest because half a mile away from our home of the Civic Centre, there are people seriously ill and we have friends, families watching over those people every day and, and every night. And like everywhere else in this country and the world, uh, people are going through real basic fundamental uh, decisions and, and emotions. So in some ways, this debate is a bit, I don't want to say pathetic, but it's when you think about it in the big scale of things, it's it's next to uh, to, to, uh, to nothing. I must admit, I didn't read the uh, your Harlow um, uh, comments that Russell has put in, but factually what uh, Tony Edwards said about regeneration was uh, absolutely spot on and I thank him uh, uh, for that. Employability is going to be key to the recovery of whenever we can get into recovery. And I compliment uh, Eugenia and others uh, on, on putting things out there to support local businesses to make that particular difference. So I think this budget is about coming together, everybody to together collectively, because actually we've got a bigger problem out there. And that is how do we get people back into work children back into education, people feeling safe and secure, mm -hmm. and hopefully the majority of people getting their vaccinations as mm -hmm. soon as possible. So I just want to say uh, thank you very much. And I will be, of course, uh, supporting uh, the substantive uh, motion regarding the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Lisa? Uh, Councillor Russell Perrin. Councillor Perrin. Thank you, Chair. Um, before I get into the main thrust of what I wanted to say, um, in the main debate around the amendment, Councillor Danvers suggested that there was £300,000 being put into the hardship fund. I'm, I'm assuming that was just a slip of the tongue. It's actually 155000 that they're putting in. Um, but, you know, I've heard a lot tonight about um, how incompetent and reckless the Tories are with finances and how um, we're not supporting the residents of the town. Um, but I thought a little fact check might be in order. Um, it is true that Labour are raising the council tax again and the rise is cumulative. So it's not as small as is being purported tonight. Um, but let's just remind ourselves of some of the other poor mismanagement of the finances we've witnessed over the last 12 months or so. We've seen £83,000 of taxpayers' money spent on a PR company to promote Harlow. We've seen three and a half million pounds lost because they didn't build any council homes. Um, we've seen hundreds of thousands spent on purchasing homes on the open market for council rent because they haven't built any. We've seen 10 million pounds lost that should have gone to regenerating the town because their bid, and I quote, did not meet the stringent criteria on value for money for the taxpayer. We've had bungled bin contracts, leaving uh, bins unemptied and costing us a lot of money. We've had no uh, progress on the Regeneration Town Centre. We've had hundreds of local businesses go without urgent financial support because the council was sat on government grants that are needed by local businesses. And for Councillor Edward to say that is fiction, he needs to get out there and speak to those businesses that are saying they have asked for the money and it has not arrived. So I find that really, really, really poor of him to say that. In stark contrast, as well as us proposing the uh, council tax freeze and real terms cut, as Point of order, Chair. Well over 160 Point million. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Point of order, Chair. What I said was factually correct. This council has paid out uh, substantial sums of government money to businesses. There may well be still businesses that are that are in the pipeline to receive funding, but that does not take away from the fact that money has been paid. And the way you're presenting it at the moment, Councillor Perring, is as if no money has been paid out. That is factually incorrect. Councillor Perring. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, I'm sure the businesses that haven't received their government grant would uh, choose to disagree with that. Um, coronavirus support from our government, totaling over £160 million in support, 16,000 Harlow jobs protected by the furlough scheme, 5,000 
Harlow self-employed residents supported by the self-employment scheme. 2,441 local businesses boosted by the bounce back loans worth 64 million. 88 local businesses boosted by the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme worth 20 and a half billion. 15.7 million in business grants for Harlow businesses. 1 million to help residents who are struggling with their council tax and rough sleepers moved into accommodation. That is not to include all of the extra investment in the NHS we've seen over the past 12 months. The infrastructure investment that we've seen, the infrastructure investment we've seen, and the money we've seen going into extra policing and into education and, champion, and championing apprenticeships. Madam uh, Chair, we have heard tonight consistently that how good the council are at managing our finances and they've put this budget in front of us. We have shown that this council tax rise is not needed. Only last year, um, they protested that they didn't need to be, that they couldn't be a council tax freeze, only to double count the money they were using for Pets Corner, which would have allowed for a council tax freeze and change to spare. We've heard from the auditors only this year, there were still ongoing discrepancies with the end of, with the uh, statement of accounts and massive delays. And when I asked at the audits committee, have you ever in your professional career seen such a discrepancy between the council finances and your own assessment? They said, no, fact. It's all videoed, it's all out there in the public domain. Chair, as Councillor Johnson has said, we have moved a slimmer budget, but to paint us as incompetent and only short-termism, they only need to look at their record in government themselves. They have not sought to help people who are in business in this town. They have not sought with this budget to help what is called the squeeze middle. They have raised council tax year on year and they're trying to pass it off as a paltry increase when we know the increase effect is cumulative. It is not fair and it is not the right time to do this. They can point to other branches of government and complain about what other people are doing, but they are doing the same themselves. It is not right, it is not fair, and I cannot support it. But you lost the vote, Russell. Thank you, Councillor Perrin. Lisa? Councillor Joel Charles. Councillor Charles. Thank you, Chair. I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in tonight's debate. And I come to this in sorrow. Clearly, our town has gone through a very difficult period of time as infection rates across the town from the Christmas period into the new year shocked all of us. And although I recognise that there has been attempts at a cross-party approach to dealing with the pandemic, there have still been failings which I think are highlighted clearly in the administration's budget, and I will explore them in a moment. But I want to pay tribute to the families, those individual health workers, our key workers, who day in, day in, day in, day and night are there for us. They're on our side, they're fighting this on the front line, and they should always be in, be in our thoughts. And I know that all of our minds, irrespective of political colour, we want them to succeed. Tonight's budget by Labour is a classic. For eight years out of the last nine, we've seen council tax increases. It is a consistent theme by this administration, the Labour Party in Harlow, that they believe council tax increases are the way to prosperity. I fundamentally disagree with them. And tonight, what I want to highlight is this is not a people's budget, it is an administrator's budget that lacks no vision and is not anchored by a clear strategy. The whopping council tax increase this year is a knee-jerk reaction by the Labour Party. As we've seen during the pandemic, the government has come to the rescue of businesses and individuals in this town. And it is because of a slow response by this administration that our hardworking businessmen and women are not getting their grants. It's time for this administration to get their act together and start looking after Harlow's businesses. What also alarms me with this budget is the lack of attention to the regeneration agenda. We know 
in the Christmas period that the council's failed attempt and loss of significant funds was an error on their part. And they will wear that badge and we will hold them to account for it. And tonight we will continue as an opposition to ask the difficult questions. It is a running theme by this administration that they consistently say they don't want detailed questions. Well, my residents, the residents of this town, want those questions answered because there's a consistent theme with the Labour Party. Increased council taxes, no improvements in services. Services like bin collections bungled by this administration on a regular basis. They really do need to get their act together. What we've shown tonight is that we are an administration in waiting. We've put forward an alternative budget tonight with proposals for a council tax cut in real terms for residents, because that's the choice we make. Instead of increasing council tax and spending money, thousands of pounds, on a monorail scheme, we believe that money should be used to cut council tax. Why this obsession with the monorail? I think for all of us in this town, we keep asking that question. Why won't the administration disclose the money for six months with an external consultant? What are they trying to hide? Why were well, they are explicit in it in their budget proposals? At the end of the day, Chair, residents have a clear choice. We've presented that. We have an administration in waiting that has a vision not just for um, improving people's lives through a real terms council tax cut, backing our families, supporting the recovery with a clear vision that we have consistently put forward, or a Labour administration that continually wants to increase taxes on hardworking people in this town. That is the choice open to people. At the end of the day, we're left with a very stark choice. And I think this budget, as I have said, bears all the hallmarks of administrators with no vision. It's lacking in any real purpose to deal with the economic and social recovery that our town deserves. And we're taking a backward step to the dark old days of Labour administrations that don't know what they want to do for our town. Well, the Conservatives have a plan and we're ready to get going. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Lisa? Councillor Andrew Johnson, Chair. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Where to start, Chair? It's, it's sometimes so depressing. I, in some respects, I agree with Councillor Tony Durkin. Um, the, these matters are very small when we look at just Harlow Council, but actually to a struggling family, Budget night of Harlow Council can actually be a really big issue. What I've heard tonight, Chair, is talk from the administration, a lot of which has just been chaff. It's not really been about their budget. There's been a lot said about Essex County Council's budget, the police and fire crime commissioner's budget, the government. There's not been a great deal said about Harlow. Um, what the leader has said, and members of his cabinet, is they've questioned the financial competence of the opposition. Yet we hear from Councillor Perrin that the auditors have still got issues with the financial competence of the administration. We've heard that £300,000 is being kept aside in an extra reserve just because the administration don't believe that the government wants to invest and support Harlow. Yet we've heard this year about the new hospital for Harlow, more than £160 million worth of COVID support already flowed to the town, millions of pounds for the college. We know the government's willing to support Harlow and wants to support Harlow. In, in fact, may it be said, I think our, our MP is possibly the most expensive MP in Parliament. Uh, he's bringing that much money into the town from this government. No, Chair, there's an ideology here tonight, the ideology of we must increase council tax. Well, Chair, I don't believe in that. I don't agree with that. I, I want to seek low taxation and money in people's pockets where at all possible. And you know, Chair, Instead of putting £300,000 in an extra reserve just in case the government doesn't come through on their pledge, I think reserves are there for a rainy day, Chair. And I don't know if any of you have noticed, but with what we're facing with COVID at the moment, it is absolutely pouring down outside. Our residents deserve better. Our residents deserve a break. Our residents deserve a council tax freeze. You've already voted that down. 
I cannot support a council tax rise, Chair, and I advise my members of the opposition to vote against your rise, which is pernicious and do being done at the wrong time. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Lisa? Um, there's no further hands up, Chair. Okay. In that case, um, Councillor Inger, will you sum up? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, when Councillor Johnson talks about uh, us referring to um, Essex County Council and the government, I think Harlow residents are interested. When their council tax bill falls on their doormat, they look at how much they've got to pay. And year in, year out, we've come to this um, budget um, debate presenting a sustainable budget with a modest increase and conservative councillors have attacked us for that modest increase, an inflation only increase. And yet they've then toddled off to Essex and voted for increases in Essex County Council's um, budget. Now, let me just remind you of the figures. In the last four years, and I use those because that's how long I've been a councillor or how many budgets I've uh, sat through. In the last four years, the total, the cumulative total, that's every increase over the four years added up for Harlow residents, voted for and agreed by Harlow Labour is £14.77 pence a year. Whereas the Conservatives in Essex for the same period amounts to £203.28 pence, and the Conservatives have voted to agree that. And then they come here and they talk about hard-pressed Harlow residents. I agree with him. Harlow residents are hard-pressed. But the whopping increase is a Conservative increase. And any attempt to try and paint that off as Labour, a Labour increase, is disingenuous at best. And then we come on to the deceits that we've heard today and the incompetence that we've heard today. And it has to be pointed out. The Conservative Finance and Resources spokesperson doesn't know the difference between a freeze and a cut. He doesn't even know his own proposal. The Conservative Finance and Resources spokesperson says um, that they are not raiding reserves. When they're not immediately raising reserves, but they're using new homes bonus money, and which used to go into um, our discretionary fund, and then raiding reserves to pay that. It's dishonest. Councillor Charles talks about our whopping increase, our increase of 10 pence a week. It's not honest. Look, councillors, we presented a balanced budget tonight. It's balanced, it's sustainable, and it's sustainable for the long term. Not just the three years that, uh, budget that the Conservatives keep bringing back to this council, even though they are warned by senior finance officers that beyond the three year period, it is unsustainable and will create a dangerous black hole in the council's finances. In just a few months time, Harlow residents will be voting in council elections. Now that's a serious and solemn duty of a citizen. And I would suggest that trust forms an important part of the decision that they will make. Tonight we've seen an attempt to mislead. We've seen deceit. We've seen the Conservatives deceived by omission. We've seen them get it plain wrong again and again and again. I trust that come May, or whenever the election may be, that Harlow residents will remember the deceit we've heard tonight. They will remember the dissembling and the misleading and the attempt to dress up um, council tax increases largely voted and agreed by Conservatives in Essex as somehow being Labour's fault here in Harlow. They will remember, they will remember the spokesperson 
for finance and resources saying we're in government. We're not, Councillor Perrin. Boris Johnson is a Tory. You are in government. We are in office in the council. You seem very, very confused tonight. Harlow Labour have presented something that's sustainable, secure, and at 10 pence a week, affordable. And I would urge all of the councillors to support that budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ingle. Now we come back to um, the um, roll call. And this is um, reference from Cabinet items a, item 9A to F. So Simon, can you um, do the roll call on the vote, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, members may vote for budget um, items against or abstain. Uh, Councillor David Carter. Against. Councillor Charles. Against. Councillor Churchill. Against. Councillor Clark. For. Councillor Danvers. For. Councillor Davis. For. Councillor Dunn. For. Councillor Durkin. For. Councillor Edwards. For. Councillor Garnet. Against. Councillor Hardware. Against. Councillor Harvey. For. Councillor Hookup. Abstain. Councillor Ingle. For. Councillor Gizzard. For. Councillor Andrew Johnson. I wish to vote against a council tax rise. Councillor Eddie Johnson. Against. Councillor Shona Johnson. Against. Councillor Livings. Against. Councillor Mullard. Councillor Perrin. Against. Councillor Purton. For. Councillor Shears. For. Councillor Souter. Against. Councillor Strachan. For. Councillor Toll. For. Councillor Vince. For. Councillor Waite. For. Councillor Watson. For. Uh, Chair, that is 17 for, 11 against, one abstention, that is carried. Thank you very much, Simon. Okay, uh, so that's carried for the um, budget. We're still on item nine because we now go into item uh, G on that, and that's the licensing committee. Um, who would be moving this item? Would it be Shannon? Jazzard? Yes, Chair, it should be. Okay. Yeah. And seconder for this one? I'll second that, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ingle. Um, can I expect that you agree on this item? Could I agree. make a point, Chair? Sorry. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Sorry, sure, I, think, I think somebody wants to speak, Chair. Okay. Right, we are now getting um, close to 9.30. We shouldn't take much longer on this. Do yeah, can I move? Can I extend standing orders by ten minutes? I move that we extend okay, standing orders by ten minutes. Thank you. Okay, that that deals with that part. Okay, who wants to speak? Uh, me, Danny Purton. Okay, <laughs> sorry, Councillor Purton. <laughs> right, carry yeah, on. I, ju I just wanted to uh, make a point uh, about this report. Uh, not so much uh, the, the content of it, but the way it's presented. I don't, I'm not, uh, you know, making a big criticism, but it's, it's just a point um, that I, I, looking at this report, you wouldn't have a clue what it was about. It could be about the depth of the tyre tread. You wouldn't know. And when you, uh, from the item on the agenda, and then when you go to the actual report, you wouldn't know either from the recommendations. You have to go about 15 pages into the report to realise it's about sexual exploitation of women and children and 
taxi drivers. Now, I just make the point that, yes, obviously you can't put everything about a report in the actual title of the report, but I think sometimes it's best to give a little hint because looking at that, you know, nobody's got a clue unless they've gone into the, read the report in detail, that it's actually about sexual exploitation. And, you know, somebody might miss something. So I just, it's just a question of making sure a report gives you an idea of what it's about. Okay. Councillor Jazzard, would you like to come back on that? I don't have anything particularly to say about that. I think we um, obviously agree the report and it got passed on to Cabinet, so I'm fine if people want to go to the vote. Okay, right. So are we agreeing with this? Yeah? Yep. Okay, right. Yeah. Thank you very much, councillors. Item 10, reports from officers, um, A and B. Um, Councillor Mark Ingle, you're proposing this, aren't you? Yeah, I move that, Chair. And Councillor Eugenie Harvey, you're second in this? I do. And are you, as councillors, agreeing with this? Chair, yeah, I believe Councillor Johnson wants to speak. And Andrew Johnson? Thank you, Chair. Apologies for not giving you prior notice to this. I didn't okay. contact the Chief Executive. Um, I'd also like to move an amendment to this or an additional item um, that Councillor Clive sue to replace Councillor Tony Hall's position on the licensing committee. I did also attempt to speak to the leader of the council as well to give him advance notice. Mm. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, Is I'd like I'd like to accept what um, Councillor Johnson has suggested. Um, I think both make these changes with heavy hearts. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking as well, as I know everybody else is. So with that amendment, are we agreeing with item 10 A and B? Great. 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 Uh, thanks very much, councillors. Item 11, this is a note in from Cabinet, um, agreed, well, not agree on, it's noted. Item 12, urgent business, I've had none. Okay. So thank you very, very much, councillors, and do keep safe. And see yes. you again 